Um, Alvaro, if you would like to go ahead and introduce our topic today. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about de uh, debugging in production. So everything about when your device is out in the field or in a customer's hands and something goes wrong, how do you deal with it? Or in the ocean. Or in the ocean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks very much, Alvaro. So um, now we're just going to have the panelists introduce ourselves. We got some familiar faces and a new face today, which is great. So um, Alvaro, if you want to just introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Alvaro. I am currently a principal embedded software engineer at SoFar Ocean Technologies. I am a, an uh, embedded and embedded software and electrical engineer. I've been working on these things for over a decade now. I do electronics and software on the side as well for as a hobby. <laughs> and so I love this stuff uh, mm -hmm. and I work on it most most of the most of the days. Uh, yep, that's, that's about it. Oh, I also have a reverse engineering podcast. Sorry, the unnamed reverse engineering podcast. Oh yeah, and we'll, we'll provide links to all these um, <laughs> these folks, these wonderful folks' uh, podcasts and various uh, blogs. Um, Philip, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Philip. I'm the founder of Embedded Artistry. Um, I'm a consultant and educator, and like Avaro, I'm uh, also an electrical engineer who spent most of his career writing software. Um, my current interests right now are in designing software for change, automated software quality enforcement, and building systems that we can easily test and debug. So I think you know these topics are going to be relevant for the discussion. Awesome. And uh, Tyler, could you introduce yourself? Of course. Uh, I'm Tyler. I'm I'm one of the co-founders of Memfault. Uh, I work directly with with Noah uh, and the other team members here. Um, I was a firmware engineer at Pebble and at Fitbit. Um, and yeah, I think I constantly found myself writing less firmware and writing more tools and trying to debug in, you know, in production. That was kind of like one of my favorite things to do. Uh, who cares about debugging on your desk when you can't reproduce it? And so I was trying to do it all in production. And, and I have a sticker of Alvaro's podcast here. So I had to shut it off. Um, go listen. It's great. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, thank you guys all for joining today. We're very excited. Um, so we're just going to dive right in. We have uh, a couple of group questions and then some individual questions and then rapid fire questions. Uh, so we got a lot of material to cover today, but we're gonna try and get through it as best we can. Um, so to kick us off, we have a group question for everyone. So this is gonna be, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So typically when we encounter a problem ourselves or are notified by a customer um, of something going wrong in the system, the first step is to reproduce it. But sometimes that can be quite difficult or impossible on your desk. So uh, especially if it's some niche corner case that only like a few users are experiencing. So from your experience debugging these types of problems, um, what's the debugging inf information that you always make sure to set up before shipping devices? I guess, I guess I'll go first, yeah. Uh, so uh, for our use case, we, we make buoys that are in the ocean, as you said, sometimes in the middle of the ocean, middle of nowhere, sometimes at a customer site near, near shore. But either way, um, we don't have direct access to them and we have, network connectivity, but it's extremely expensive and low bandwidth. So the things we've been doing to make sure that we have all the information you need is send kind of metrics on a regular basis. So you want to see the, the health of your system up to the point of failure or bug is super useful. Also, if possible, uh, doing core dumps to either an SD card or if you can send some a uh, little bit of that remotely, it's incredibly useful. But but knowing what happened up to the point of failure is incredibly useful in my experience. I would add to that. Go ahead, Tyler. No, I was just going to be knowing what's happening up to the point of failure. Are you just using that logs or metrics or like, what are you actually tracking there? Like, yeah, how, yes. how are you guys doing that? So, you know, we, we want to know the temperature, the humidity, if, if there's a oh, leak, okay. the humidity, the moisture is going to go up, right? Power consumption, you can track hardware failures if you have a short circuit or, or just a, another device might be failing. Before you start seeing communication errors, you might see power consumption go up. So we've had cases where, where um, one of our interfaces that's in the water has a, has a leak and it shorts out, but before it completely fails, power consumption starts going up, up, up. And then the device just stops working kind of thing. So th there's just kind of measuring things. I've also personally, we're using an RTOS. So I like to measure uh, memory, like heap consumption, uh, allocation, like the delta of how many allocs and freeze, just in case you have a memory leak somewhere. 
all these things can be useful. So just kind of a snapshot of the system as a whole, I, I'd say. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think, you know, like I always want core dumps. I certainly always want to have device metrics. Um, you briefly mentioned logging. I think logging is an essential tool. Um, and even in low bandwidth situations, now we have a lot of, you know, library implementations that take the approach of replacing your strings with like a numerical identifier to really compress the data that you're sending over. It requires post-processing, but, you know, you can get more information in the same amount of space that way. Processors will tell you why they reset. You know, it's good to read that register. Are you resetting because your system browned out? Was there a hardware reset that you didn't expect? Did a watchdog timer go off? Like just even basic information like that can really make or break your ability to, to find a problem. Um, can we trace our problem to a specific hardware and firmware version, right? That should be part of your core dump. That should certainly be in a log message. It should be in a check-in message or some kind of metric collection. And I think, you know, something that I'm, that is new to my tool set that I'm really trying to incorporate more of is for uh, systems that are heavily event and state driven, you can create a serialized event lock. What events were processed in what order? Because with that, you can actually see the sequence of events that led up to a failure versus going through a log file. You might have incomplete coverage. You might, you know, there might be something that you didn't note that you can't actually see this particular thing happen. But if you explicitly record events, you're going to have a record. And, you know, in a, a sufficiently advanced setup, you might even be able to play your event log back through a functional simulator to try to even recreate something approximating the system state. Um, so those, I think, are tools that I always want to have, no matter what system I'm working on. That uh, last one you mentioned about like tracing device behavior over time is like something that web developers and backend developers, of course, have had for many, many years, right? <laughs> so to see, so we've seen a couple of libraries come up recently around that, um, or you know, blog posts, and it's like very exciting to see it happen on the embedded side. Yeah. Coming out of the dark ages, you just got to exactly. store it in like a K of space, though, right? Like find a way. <laughs> that's 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 the <laughs> tricky part. Yeah. yeah, or you know, we have uh, SD cards and our devices. But if you can't get to the SD card, all those logs are useless. So it's it's always a, a compromise. And, and really a, a <laughs> yeah. no. I don't know if that, about <laughs> that, but I mean, it's always a problem, right? It's like, I've got all this data. And what if I trigger a fault in my SD writing routine or in my, you know, I'm writing this out to Spinor. Um, these are cases that do come up and, you know, it's hard to have a resolution for that other than make sure that piece of code is as rock solid as you can make it so you can save this information for when you do need it. So you had mentioned logging before. Um, you know, obviously, that can be a problematic uh, subject as well as very extremely powerful. Um, do you have like any sort of experiences with like good, good or bad logging um, setups? Well, yeah, I, it's probably my least favorite debugging technique because it's it's the most difficult to use correctly. Like my experience with logs is that a log statement is added to debug some specific problem, and then that problem's fixed, and we like never review or never remove that from the log. And so our log statement or our log files are just a bunch of strings that don't actually matter to us, rather than being something we've intentionally structured. And in a limited memory system, like every useless log statement's a liability. That's potentially going to push information that I really did need to see out of the buffer, right? I can only keep a limited amount of like, you know, log contents at any given time. So you really want to carefully think about what you're going to log. Configurable log levels, definitely something you want, both at compile time, right? So you can make some very verbose um, statements if you need them, but even at runtime, being able to selectively turn on and off what statements are being written can be powerful. I don't have to, you know, send a new firmware update out just to get information if I can have somebody change a setting and they can now collect more, more debugging information. Um, yeah, that's, and, that's exactly what we're doing. It's, uh, we can remotely change the logging level. So if a customer is having issues, we hmm. want to, instead of asking them to, Hey, can you go you know, command line to this device and change things, we can just be like, hey, log more and just send us the SC card after, you know, the, the, the logs are there. But it, it reduces the friction with a customer to try to get more data. Because if, if you have to instruct someone how to do it, you know, not every user is technical. 
Right. How does that work, Elvira? Does is the device actually querying a server somewhere to say like, please change my log level, or is it is it per file or per module? Is it literally just like error warning? We just send a info? command, so so we, we can we can send command to individual devices. <clears throat> so they the provide they they send their own data, you know, hourly, for example. So every time mm -hmm. they send data, they check to see if there's any data waiting for them, and we can uh, jump in there and say, hey, change your log levels or or configuration or anything like that. Sweet, and that's awesome. assuming I guess no one puts a really spammy log line in in the wrong level because that's the uh, worst. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I've I've uh, I spent a lot of time debugging the the SD card uh, driver so that we can handle extremely spammy buffers uh, logs not with buffering. Uh, but but yeah, okay. I, I I still err on the I I will drop logs before I crash the system, but that was a choice, a very deliberate choice that. You know, do I want the system to keep restarting or just start dropping log lines? Um, but yeah. Uh, something I've seen uh, when I was working at Fitbit in particular, when we do like a code review of some new module or um, like a new feature, part of the code review process is like saying, you know, why don't we throw a couple like error logs in these like, um, you know, extraordinary conditions essentially. Um, and I, I felt like that really empowered the logging sort of feature of the whole the whole device. No one would advocate for logs, and I would advocate for an assert. <laughs> I, I I assert I'm I'm a fan of asserts, um, but they they it's it's a hard it's a hammer, right? Just like boom, restart. <laughs> but it, it it does help catch bugs, especially early days, um, yeah. quickly because like, well, why did it crash? Oh, I forgot to check this thing. <laughs> this should never happen. Assert. I'm like, well. <laughs> it happens. Turns out it happens once an hour, you know? Yes. <laughs> you find it very quickly. <clears throat> and even um, better, I think, though, is like you hook up your assert to your crash dump handler, right? So you get a full backtrace. Absolutely. You see exactly what happened, right? So that's, I think, really where I find asserts in production to be the most powerful. There's a, there's a really great blog post. I, I don't know who wrote it about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the intro blog, and I will keep saying that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm curious, Alvaro. So, I mean, yeah, I guess uh, full disclosure, Alvaro is a mem or his company is a, a customer of Memfault. Like, what did you do before having full core dumps with Memfault? <laughs> I read like, the blogs. You just read the and blog and like, tried to... <laughs> Yeah. Got so, okay. uh, I well, I honestly I didn't know what Mount Fault actually did, but the 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 blog is one of the best embedded resources. And I, you know, like, I mean, I knew about hard fault registers and all that stuff. And so I just hooked up my assert and my my hard faults and all the different faults to capture, you know, your PC, your L link register, perk encounter, and kind of reset reason and and just have that little blurb. So at least I would know where the program crashed. I, I wasn't yeah. doing full core dumps or anything like that, but at least I knew where the problems were were happening. And there's a question that I want to comment on real quick related to core dumps. So I think you know there's two concepts, right? There's the GDB style core dump where I'm going to get a complete download of everything that's going on in memory processor state so I can recreate that program state. Often that's very difficult to do on an embedded platform, you, you just don't have enough memory to save that stuff usually or enough bandwidth to get it off. Um, so I think that what we're all talking about, just to be clear, is you know we're talking about a lightweight core dump approach. We're going to print out all the processor registers. We're going to get stack traces. If we're a multi-threaded system, we're going to get a stack trace for every thread. If there's a fault, we're going to um, you know decode that fault and print the, the fault information out. We're going to have the hardware and firmware version. If you've got a log, your, you know, your log dump might be part of that core dump. So it's not necessarily like a full file that you can go and load into a debugger and like I can, you know, run GDB and literally debug the program from this particular state. But it's still enough that we can take a snapshot of what that program looked like at that moment and then at least try to, you know, interpret that what's going on to see if we can get insight into the bug or even, you know, reproduce it ourselves. That is my favorite kind of core dump, though. When I, there's an SD card available, I will dump all of RAM onto it. <laughs> yeah, it's true, and that that is that is truly the best. Especially, I mean, if you're internal and you have a cellular connection or you have Wi-Fi, like that's the one you should almost have enabled by default. Um, but yeah, to, to to your point, Philip, I think you can you can even even the small stack dump you can download as a GDB core dump in Memphis. So maybe maybe you didn't see that feature yet. 
Um, we, we have seen recently, um, in particular on the Android side, these, this notion of like mini dumps or like alternative kind of dump, um, uh, like formats essentially, um, that dump out like different types of data. Um, and it's something that I think is pretty, like that, that sort of approach is very interesting on our devices where we can't necessarily save that much data, um, but even a few hundred bytes is enough often for uh, like you to diagnose a problem, which I think is, it's always so exciting. It's like a thrill, you know, right? <laughs> To be able to pick up those breadcrumbs so, yeah a few hundred bytes is enough to get to at least the stack trace and a couple like uh local variables or 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 parameters so it's generally good enough um yeah and i think my only addition i think we talked about a lot about it but like what is the other thing that i make sure to do before shipping i just keep asserts in i never take asserts out generally unless like i am 100 percent certain that those asserts are like useless and they're not going to ever trigger again um, but yeah, and then, uh, of course, like everything else, fill up an algorithm. Well, yeah, the, the certs are great because you know exactly which line of code it's in. So even if you have the super light core dump, which is user program counter LR, you, you'll know, oh, we hit this assert. So, so that I do have enabled. So even if it's in the middle of the ocean, if there is a crash, I will know what line it was. You know, I won't know the memory around it, but at least if it's an assert, I, I'll know. Um, for users of Zephyr Artos, uh, certs are disabled by default. So there's a little. Oh my gosh! <laughs> tip to, you got to flip them on because who knows? It's an open source Artos. There could be a driver that's exploding on you. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, the, the, the one art, one one assert I did disable recently was the automatic that I enabled early on was whenever I try to do malloc and there's not enough memory, it would assert immediately. But now some of the code actually can be like, hey, I can't get this big a buffer. That's okay. I'll just do something else. So that's the one I, I took out. But it was very useful early on to be like, oh, I'm out of memory somewhere. What's going on? Philip, I think you have a great article about stack canaries. Is that right? Sort of I did. Yeah, I implemented memory detection. Yep. And that, you know, that I turned that on. It was, it's one of those things that I think traditionally used to just be turned off flat out in embedded programs to save on um, binary size. But, you know, I, throughout my career, we've just gotten more and more memory for cheaper and cheaper. So yeah. um, taking advantage of things like um, stack checking has been really beneficial and caught bugs that um, I, I didn't expect. It's, you know, the the compiler stack checking is somewhat limited. There's also many RTOSs do things like fill the um, stack or the heap with a specific value so you can turn on um, checking to make sure that you're not having any variables right past their expected boundaries. Um, you know, things like that can be great for detecting bugs, you know, during development before your customers ever hit these problems. It's always the MPU. <laughs> That's what I said right below yes. my stack. If it grows a little too hard, it's not gonna, it's not gonna like it. Yes, that is that is an awesome approach. Uh, and another okay, one, well, if you don't have an MPU, uh, put it at the bottom stack, uh, start the stack at the bottom of memory. And then if you try to grow down below, it'll usually get a, a memory fault, <laughs> depending on clever. your architecture. That's a great tip. Do you have to do a double pass of the linker for that typically? Yeah, that's the approach I've seen. Well, you just, it's just, well, at least on ARM, it's just the, 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 the first word oh, right. or the second, the second uh, word is going to be pointing to the top of stack, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, I, and then for sizing it, sometimes people do like a double pass to um, allocate like the full remaining data um, right at the end. Um, and I actually will send out a link after that to that article. It's a super interesting approach thing. Sorry for the rant there. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, thanks you all. That was a great discussion. Um, and so now we're gonna move on to a couple of individual questions. So first off is uh, Philip, you're in the hot seat. So we've got um, the question for you is going to be, how do you leverage uh, static analysis tools, um, continuous integration, hardware in the loop testing, et cetera, for catching the, uh, bugs prior to uh, production release? Um, and then what do you do to like fine tune this pro uh, process after you find bugs in production? Uh, great question. You know, we definitely want to have all these capabilities we've talked about. But I think for me, the best case scenario is I never have to use them because I just got it right the first time. And so I think everything you mentioned is a step in that direction, right? They add guardrails to our process that stop us from putting bugs in. And if you can't take advantage of these connect, these techniques that we're discussing for any reason, you gotta be on board the get it right the first time train, right? That's really where your mindset needs to be. 
Static analysis is really great because every finding from a static analysis tool is a line of code in your system that could be improved in some way, even if that way is just making a comment explaining why this line of code is actually okay and why it's safe to turn off the warning right here. You know, every one of those issues that you're ignoring, you're just inviting Murphy to come and pay you a visit as you start scaling up the number of devices. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and you might not be able to, to necessarily reproduce or track down these um, strange corner cases with language ordering and timing and things like that. Or even just confusing code where you're going to make a change that um, has unintended consequences. Testing, I mean, there's so much to say about testing. I, you know, I go all over the remaining time for that, but I think the biggest benefit is I get to describe what I expect my software to do. And I can have my software checked every single time I'm committing code or making a build to make sure it does what I expect. And if there's something that doesn't meet expectations, I get told about it. That's a big part of like not introducing bugs that our customers are going to hit, right? As I, I mean, I've worked with dozens of teams and I just can't tell you how many times we fixed an issue to check in a new one or to make a regression or, or things like that. We want the safety net in place. So we, we know that our software is doing what we think. Um, when we invest further in our testing processes, like we can start to flush out bugs that our customers are likely to see. We could, you know, we could make our testing more stressful. We can inject faults. We can do things like um, boot cycling or OTA upgrades and downgrades to different versions, right? We want to put our system through its paces, and ideally, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that we flush out all the bugs in um, all the scenarios in the worst case scenarios that a user might run into. I think the automation piece of it, the really is what brings it all together, though, and makes it deliver value in a compounding way. Right. I don't have to rely on my fickle human laziness and error proneness. I have a computer that's going to do all this stuff on every commit, on every build. You know, I'm going to not be able to check in code that is known to be problematic. Right. So we're stopping bugs at the source. Um, why spend time debugging if you could just not put the bugs in the first place? And manual testing and validation is not really scalable. Right. Like, as the development process goes on, we just have more and more stuff that we need to check, which means you need more testers, your testing is going to happen less often, and you're going to start dropping tests that would be useful to run, but you just don't have the time for. But my computer can execute things much faster than humans, and it can do it repeatedly. And so that allows small teams especially to really scale the, um, the quality assurance efforts they can perform just by automating them. If you were going to invest in one, I mean, I think that's where I'd start, right? Just having a simple repeatable process period is the key to um, adding all this other stuff in and making sure you're able to guarantee a certain level of confidence about every build and every change. In production, you know, I don't know that everything, ch anything changes. I guess the state of the world changes, right? Um, our product's been used in this relatively safe, constrained environment. There's not so much environmental noise. We're using it in one configuration. We're testing things in one room. We've got our tests written. And unless you're like a super advanced tester, your tests are doing things in the same order every time, right? Your users are gonna do things you didn't think of. Your imagined worst case scenarios are not going to map to what's gonna happen out in the real world. You're gonna be, you know, your product's gonna be used in a high density apartment building where there's 45 Wi-Fi networks in range that are causing a lot of interference that's affecting your system's operations. So we've got to expect that we're still going to have to deal with this kind of problem. And all we need to do is continue the investment, right? If we if there's a problem that our test didn't catch, we didn't sufficiently describe our expectations for the software. So we need to go back, add a test that would catch that failure, make sure our change actually gets the test to pass, keep going on. And that's the way that we, we keep that going. Um, you know, and again, making sure we don't have any regressions. Like as a customer, I hate when there's a new firmware build and an old problem comes back. And so we don't want to do that to our customers either. Oh, that's great. Um, thank you, Philip. I, I know you could probably talk for, and all of us could talk for hours on this stuff, but, <laughs> uh, but unfortunately we got, we got to keep moving. So um, next question, um, Alvaro, you're up. So um, we've got this one that's particularly targeted, I think, to your, your domain. <laughs> so what are some challenges behind writing code for devices that have intermittent connectivity um, such as your buoys at Silver Ocean, um, and what kind of things do you need to think about, um, you know, data points especially that you want to be collecting in between these like intermittent connectivity um, opportunities? Yeah, I mean, th this is our business, right? We 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 collect, we're measuring waves and winds and temperatures to 
constantly, but we don't have connectivity all the time and, and, and our connectivity is pretty limited. So, you know, we average data over time or collect it, compress it. Um, you know, if, if your sensor uh, is only 14 bits effective, like we're not going to send 16 bits. That's, that's wasting data, right? So uh, it's, it, it makes it a little more complex in the uh, coding side, but we want to compress data as much as possible. Um, other limitation is, okay, let's say we can send a message once an hour, but if these are satellites just flying overhead, might not always get a good pass. So, so we need to store it over and over, like as long as, as we, we can until the next successful transmit window. Um, it's, yeah, uh, that, <laughs> it, it's, it can be really, really tricky to, to debug issues, right? If, if a device stops calling home, all you have is the historical, historical data. Storing data in between events, uh, usually RAM is fairly safe unless it's critical, then you know you do EEPROM, you could do flash, FRAM, something like that. Um, we also, you know, there are SD cards, I guess that counts. We mostly use those just for logging data for later analysis or high data rate data. So the data we can send, let's just say, imagine you only get 340 bytes an hour and that's all you can send. Uh, it's not great for for debugging or just for development. So, so we'll log much, much da higher data rates to the SD card. And, and then if, if it is retrievable, we'll have that. Otherwise, we our team spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, which exact things do we want to send on this very limited packets? Uh, let me see what else. So implement the devices. To, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I don't know if, if you have any other questions. So you, there. You think, so you're thinking about like different levels of maybe criticality of these different data sources? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we, we also have um, kind of, we keep this, the, air, the state of each subsystem. We have kind of, we call it an error state. So it might be okay. It might be error one, two, three or warnings. And then we pack that all up again in a really tiny struct. So whenever there's a state change in any of these systems, Every so often, we'll we'll check it and send an update message to like, oh, by the way, the state has changed. We do have a a bit of a time uh, window on that because if you do have an intermittent failure, you're going to generate way too many messages, so which is going to cost us in money and power. So that is something also to to watch out for with with logging and, and reporting. Right, you don't want to report every single error if it's going to cost you like actual money to, to be setting the updates. So um, having, you know, reducing the amount of data it takes up to, to, to kind of have a picture of, of the health of your system is, so, so we have sensors and states of, of various things. Awesome. That, that's really great. And I wouldn't have even thought about that sort of hysteresis on the data collection side of things. Oh, of course, yeah. We, uh, <laughs> we also have another thing that, that that's, you know, when it's out in the middle of the ocean, you might, I, I hate that we, ha that we do, do this, but sometimes it's what you got to do. Like if, if the system's, it's not behaving properly for enough time, you might just want to restart, <laughs> like turn yeah. it off, turn it back on. And again, we also have limits on that, right? So if, if, you, if you reboot it for a particular reason too many times, we're going to stop trying because like clearly didn't fix the issue. Right. And that's something that, uh, you know, people who are not familiar, you can always persist memory. You could do a no init section that way it won't get wiped on a reboot or use the, the RTC, uh, at least on the STM32 and many, I mean, devices, the, the real time clock has a few registers that will persist. So if you have a backup battery, it will stay on. And then you can kind of pass a bit of information. Oh, I reset because of this subsystem failure. So next time that fails, you're like, I already tried restarting. Let's not do it. Very nice. That's a great strategy. Um, unfortunately, I, I would like to dive into that more, but let's move on to the, the next individual question. I'm just going to keep moving. <laughs> um, so Tyler, it's your turn. You're up. Um, this question is going to be a little bit of a change of pace. So we're going to be talking about um, sort of data security and privacy side of things, where you have a lot of experience. It's also a great juicy topic. So. <laughs> um, all right. So the question. <laughs> What do you do to balance, you know, end user privacy, so you know, keeping their data secure versus, you know, the diagnostics that that we need as developers or as like ma maintainers of these devices? So, yeah, um, it's something that always comes up. Honestly, like every every time we talk about collecting data, and also like you read blogs and and articles, being like, 
oh, this company is collecting data on you or, or from your device, what is it actually collecting? Um, I think the, the most important thing to think about here is like try your best or, or don't make it possible to collect personal information from the devices. Um, you know, don't track the location necessarily. You don't need to track the location generally of a device. Like I guess in Alvaro's case, you may need to track the GPS coordinates, but that's their like products use case. But for like, you know, consumer devices or when we were at Fitbit, like you can track maybe the state that they're in or, or the country or the region or like where it was sold. All of these things are not necessarily tracking, but it is like useful information. Um, in embedded devices, just try not to send it, try not to log the data, try not to send the data. When we, when we tell customers like capture the whole region of RAM, we, we help customers to explicitly like um, whitelist certain regions that you are allowed to send. Like only, only send these regions, don't send this private, private sector. We basically like define a linker, linker script that basically puts it off into this specific region of RAM. And then we don't send that. I don't know, Alvaro, do you actually, like mark out certain regions that you don't send? Like, is there anything that you just don't want to send from your devices? Uh, for, for the full core dump, it's everything. Which is um, everything. Cause yeah, like, well, you we, have no, you, you have no identifiable information. Like you, it's not a consumer device. No, 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 this yeah. is uh, right now. It, it's all, it's just measurements. It's just uh, yeah. waves and winds and yeah. Yeah, we, <clears> and we, that's, we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, the customer information itself is linked kind of in the back end, right? So it, yeah. it, most of the buoys out on the ocean, we own ourselves like in, that are drifting. The ones that are customer owned, those, you know, the, the data just goes to the cloud. And then that's like, you couldn't figure out who, who owns this this uh, unit, I guess, without contacting us. Yeah. And I think that's honestly the last, the last point I kind of wanted to make is like, I think we a lot of times think about consumer devices and privacy. And like, I would argue that many of the embedded devices that probably listeners are all working on are just not consumer devices. And so like, it's actually not a huge issue. And, and if they are sort of like devices that are around people, maybe maybe um, they've already had user consent or employee consent to, to certain tracking. Um, and then it's not a huge issue. But yeah, awesome. uh, yeah. Opt, opt in user reporting, make people click accept. Uh, the it has to be somewhere the text, but also like metrics are just numbers. They're not going to tie back to somebody's name or necessarily like the person itself. Do your best to to just make it about the diagnostic data and not about the actual person or or device that you're tracking. Got it. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and that's exactly what we were doing at Fitbit. So um, it does, you can diagnose devices without secret information. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, just a quick pause um, to the all the attendants. If you want to ask any questions or have us expand on any of these um, items that we've been covering, just drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll definitely um, get through as many as we can at the end. All right. So now panel is ready. We're on to our um, next and final group question. So this one is um, near and dear to my heart because I am also a hardware engineer originally. So this one is about um, how, what are the methods or like the best techniques for detecting hardware issues on these um, remotely fielded devices where you, you can't get um, like physical access to them? I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I started covering this earlier, right? Just just having all the metrics, all the measurements leading up to to the problem is the most most useful. And, and, and like I said, we've caught, We've got issues with with you know harder problems, uh, firmer problems. Um, there's you basically want all the information you can to possibly reproduce it or at least get an idea of what might be happening, right? If, if if the device failed after high high temperature, you can at least get a device in the lab and start subjecting it to high temperature, right? Um, or we've had issues <laughs> that didn't come up until the device physically moved and it, there was an error in the GPS processing code, right? And so, so now we now we introduce that in, in, in our own testing, but knowing that like the device is reporting its positions wrong now, like, okay, something is leading to, to this part of code. And piggybacking off of that, we're collecting this data, we need to actually use it. I mean, I see a lot of teams who collect a lot of metric data from their devices, but that doesn't get analyzed, right? And there's so often that we can look at the trends of a device over time. Like you mentioned, 
um, the current failures or temperature being really or current you know current being outside of an expected range temperature being outside of an expected range um, and we can see that this happens before a particular failure happens this kind of stuff is important and if you're not looking at your logs that or your metrics coming in you're going to miss that kind of stuff and, and and it might be hard to initially come up with what is the expected range what should it be right but I usually say just set it something, and if you're getting a lot of, of warnings, then now you know that maybe this is okay, and you can you can move your your, your guards a bit. But but yeah, the the, the whole we call it fleet monitoring. You, we want to see what all the devices are doing. What's their uptime, right? We we want to know if if devices are resetting in a particular cadence. That's that's a big uh, uh, you know that shows you something, right? They're <laughs> like Philip says, temperatures, uh, all sorts of things, just looking at them on a regular basis because yeah we, we've had it in the past where there was a unit out and it stopped working but nobody realized it because we were distracted with something else now you know there's slack bots now there's other sorts of of kind of notifications that that are letting us know when, when things are going wrong as opposed to us having to go constantly look Something that's always been a challenge for me on these types of devices is not the like total failure where like a sensor is you know broken or something like that you know because those are fairly easy to set up like some checks for ahead of time. It's more like okay we're getting like bad signal strength like mm -hmm. in a certain batch of units. So like what what kind of approaches would you guys take um, to like check out those types of issues? Well, one is just recording the signal strength. I mean, most radios do give you some kind of indication of the noise, whether it's a reading of the noise floor or SNR or RSSI, however they are reporting that, right? You can get some indication of what that signal strength looks like. And even just that basic piece of data can give you insight into like, okay, is there potentially interference? Are they not within range to where they can actually make a connection reliably? Um, you know, just a basic metric like that, which you can usually read out of a radio is, is often enough to help. And yeah, perhaps um, even correlate with, uh, I was just going to say, perhaps even correlate yeah. with other device things like maybe a display turns on, your radio goes mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Tyler. No worries. No, I was just going to say, like, uh, at Pebble, we had, uh, we, we manufactured, like, a, a, maybe a million or so Pebbles. But the type of, or the quality of hardware we'd get from the vendors was actually so variable. <laughs> And so like labeling what batch of chips you got or batch of hardware you got from certain things, like we'd have some displays that would draw like little to almost no power. I mean, it was e-ink and then some that would just be so bad. And it was like, oh man, I, I, this watch will like never get to four days of battery life. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know that, that you bring up something that's really uh, important and, and it is knowing exactly what went into each piece of hardware, right? So making sure this is more kind of a manufacturing thing, but when you manufacture a device, you have a serial number, you might have a IMEI for a modem, but also knowing exactly, you know, which uh, the serial number of the circuit board that went in, the which sensor modules, if you have any exter external modules, that way, if something goes wrong, you might be able to trace it back to a particular batch of sensors or a, a, a hardware revision of the circuit board. If, if you just build stuff, ship it, and then you're like, wait, which, uh, which board did this have? I don't know. It, you're going to have a really bad time. So, so kind of knowing everything. I previously worked on some um, satellites in the past, and everything was meticulously tracked because same thing. If it's in space and something goes wrong, you need to know yeah who who ran this test. You know everything. Just just keep it all so you can go do um, analysis after the fact. Every one of those uh, fancy tantalum caps is. Uh... <laughs> recorded in a book somewhere. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. Um, any other um, tips that you might have, like Philip, on the side of like hardware, like what sort of general like hardware failure use cases have you seen? So yeah, you asked and something immediately came to mind. Um, something that has been invaluable for me, especially when I cannot reproduce an issue, is to have some way to get raw recorded data of what's coming over the radio or what's coming over the bus. I mean, there's been a number of times where it's like, okay, I can't reproduce this locally, but I can get this recorded set of radio data, run it through my decoder in my simulator or my test suite, and I can see the problem the customer is having, and then I can fix it. And even better, I now have a test case, right? So going back to the testing point, I've got a new test case that I can include to make sure that um, my code's behaving the way I expect. That is probably like 
the technique that I reach for the most. I mean, you know, at, at heart, like, yeah, I got a, I got a hardware background, but I'm a software guy. So if you tell me there's a noise problem, it's like, I think, okay, it's not my problem beyond like what I can control in software. But when there are things like the driver isn't handling this particular scenario well, or the software is not handling this particular scenario well, if I can get a snapshot of that scenario, I can use it. Um, and I would definitely recommend people people try that out. I've got an article that we'll send out in the notes um, that describes how I did just that for a paging system. Um, that, you know, with a problem, again, I wasn't able to reproduce it at all, but my customer could see it 100% of the time, right? So that was what enabled me to actually fix it. A uh, question for, for Philip and Alvaro. Um, how many times is it actually a hardware bug versus a software bug? Oh, <laughs> what can I say? We're being recorded. No, um, <laughs> I'll say many times it's a firmer bug and it is my fault. But there's when you're in the ocean, it's not the most friendly environment for hardware. Mm -hmm. So it, there, there's certainly plenty of, of hardware failures just due to the environment, the, um, just motion impact, all that stuff. Uh, it, it's it's been a good it's been a good mix, uh, I'll say. And and debugging is always tricky because I always assume it's firmware, and then I have to prove that it's not, and then go to the hardware side. But that doesn't stop me from immediately when I have a firmware issue that if I have a dev board available, I will instrument it immediately, yeah. just not to waste time. Or like you say, uh, Philip, like let me see what signals are, are going through. Either just enable the raw spy bus log or UART or something instead of kind of the post-process data. Um, and, and because we have flexible logging, we can just say, hey, just log every byte that comes into this bus, just put it in a file, and then I can go look through it. Yeah, I would say for me, I mean, it's mostly a firmware bug, if we got to be honest, um, although I like to blame hardware first, you know, it's just a traditional, it's not my problem kind of reaction. Um, but I have, you know, I've done a lot of firmware development for high volume manufacturing. And so in that case, like, you know, part of my job was determining what was a software bug and what was a hardware bug, um, because you need to know whether or not you're rejecting units for good reasons, or if you're just burning money by detecting false failures. Um, so it, there are often cases where it is bad hardware, and we do need to keep in mind that it's a possibility, but you just shouldn't start assuming that, right? You need to, to do your due diligence and figure out what the actual cause of the problem is and whether or not it can be mitigated in software, whether or not it can be just completely addressed in software. You know, I would say though, it's almost never the vendor issue. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And if well, it is, check your errata in, first. Yes, <laughs> yes, I was about to say that. Um, yeah, the errata, always check it first. But no, really quick, I... Um, I, I totally agree with you, especially in production. Once you got to production, you probably ironed out a lot of those hardware issues. Occasionally, you'll see a hardware issue pop up once you have the higher volumes, just because you have a larger sample size. But most of the hardware issues usually come up during earlier stages when you're designing the thing. And the best are the software workarounds to hardware issues. Yeah. Those are my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> They're great. There's a whole the whole area of this topic about degenerative failures like batteries wearing out and stuff like that over time, but uh, we got to move on. <laughs> we'll get to it later. I hope we'll have to do another panel. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So um, now we're going to move on to the lightning round. So these are going to be individual questions that go around uh, the panel. So starting with um, Philip, what was the most challenging firmware update you've ever worked on? Well, I'd have to go back to the, the manufacturing firmware example, particularly for iPhones, when you're getting to PVT and mass production, um, you know, it's hard, it, it's hard to fix a bug when you've got VPs asking you for updates and teams in the factory that are staring at you because the line's not moving and they can't do their work. Um, debugging in those situations is challenging, but also just the scale is intimidating, right? At this stage of the development process, Apple's going to produce 30 to 50 million phones before launch day. A one in 10,000 occurrence rate issue is going to result in 3,000 phones being piled up in the repair area that you need to deal with, potentially, if it's a software bug, or you're going to, you're going to be costing the company significant amounts of money and handling retests and running units through the line multiple times just to, to get past these intermittent failures. Um, and so... You know, we did. It's amazing to me that we did all of this stuff just with manual validation. Like we didn't have any of this autom automatic 
quality checks in place when I was working there. Um, but we still got to very reliable firmware by the end. And, and you know, it, but it was always high pressure and challenging to make that work. Very tense working conditions. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, next question. First microcontroller you ever programmed? I think it was an Energy Micro Gecko, which was a Cortex M3. Very nice. All right, Chip. Um, what is your current favorite tool, hardware or software? Right now, um, I would say Alfred for Mac. And it's just given me a proper clipboard manager with clipboard history, yes. and text expansion, and I can create custom workflows. So probably more than like any programming tool, this has really enabled me to do more because I can string complex activities together and like execute them with a four-letter command. Um, you know, so that's really helped me refine what I'm doing and work more effectively. Love it. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on. Tyler, you're up. So what was the most challenging firmware update you've ever worked on? Uh, Pebble version 3.8 on the original watch. We re rewrote the bootloader. We shrinked it down from 64K to 16K. So there was like a hundred, there, there was a chance that a hundred percent of devices could be bricked <laughs> during all those updates. And we had no bricked units. Uh, the only sad watch faces we got were internally when I bricked maybe like 10 or 20 of them. Yeah, that was a, but it was super fun. Bootloader wow, updates spicy. was my backup answer, dude, because it's so stressful <laughs> when you're going to potentially break every device in the field. So I feel you on that. It is. Yeah, I was waiting for Reddit for all the sad watches to be posted on there <laughs> saying everyone's watch broke, but literally none. No, no one. It's not even on the Internet, you know, that image. So pretty cool. Uh, that's amazing. Um, first <clears throat> MCU you ever programmed? Uh, it was the one at Pebble, uh, I guess, STM32 F3, something like that. I don't know the exact one, but. Nice. Love it. A classic. Um, what is your favorite tool, hardware or software? You can reuse folks' answer if you have to. <laughs> oh, the clipboard history is so good, uh, honestly, I would say. Um, it is like my favorite thing that I tell people to use. So I'm just going to double up on it because it's it's like the one thing I tell people to get. Clipboard history. Don't waste your time. Awesome. <laughs> use it all day, every day. <laughs> Literally, I think it's like used 50 times a day for me or something like that is what my stats say. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right, I'll your turn. Uh, most challenging firmware update you've ever worked on. <laughs> so I'm actually going to answer this uh, differently, but I, I did uh, for not a firmware update, but an update of firmware. Uh, back when I was at Texas Instruments, uh, I was a new employee and I was working on the C2000, um, kind of all the drivers, right? All, all the embedded software that us as firmware engineers download and use. And that what that was provided as an installer and I was handed the laptop like this is how the installer is built is on this laptop and it was terrifying and I had to do a, a kind of a point update and I screwed up the installer I sent it out and then it would install but I forgot to update the windows registry to say like oh there's a new version so it just kept installing itself over and over and over and uh, I got a, a, a nice notice from one of the execs that is like, hey, why is this happening on my machine? And I had to go figure out what was going wrong, fix it, and, and, and push it back on. Uh, as a, I was right out of college, it was, I would say that that was, that was rough. But it was, a, it was a good learning experience. That's great. Yeah, it sounds stressful. <laughs> All right, uh, first MCU ever programmed? Uh, probably a basic stamp, I think, like a parallax basic stamp. Um, unless you count the the Lego Mindstorms, uh, must have been the late '90s. That's awesome. Oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> um, what is your current favorite tool, hardware or software? Oh, I can't pick just one. Um, so for software, I, I'm I'm a big fan of my Sublime Text. I, I I'm one of the left the, <laughs> the ones still using it. I'm not a VS Code yet. Um, I'm never hardware, moving over, man. Sublime yes, for life. It's I love it. Love my Salier. Logic analyzer, just measure all the things. Um, another one, now hardware, like more hardware. I don't know if you folks have played with the with the PC bytes, where you can just kind of, like, I don't have it all plugged in, right? But you can hold your thing, and then these probes kind of hold themselves in place. And when debugging any sort of hardware, it's like you don't have to hold probes around. It's fantastic. And then when you really, really have to pull this one out, there's nothing better. <laughs> when you cannot reproduce things, um, I'll pull out the JLink to JTrace. Um, and, and then 
I haven't, this is not yet my favorite, but I just got it and it's kind of an open source trace tool um, that I really hope catches on because it's orders of magnitude cheaper. <laughs> That's it. Wow. <laughs> have those a lot are of great. Tools. Those, those PCB bytes are fantastic and incredibly worth the value. They're like so helpful. Yes. Glad, glad you mentioned it. All right. Um, we're going to dive into some audience questions now. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's say, start with this one. So how would you debug um, when an embedded device is just crashing and burning and it's like basically stuck in an abnormal state? Like what's the approach is there? And you have access to it? I uh, mean, yeah. if we if we have access to it, I would just plug in a debugger and see what, what's going on. Ah, but <laughs> if it's a production system, can you plug in a debugger, right? That is a problem. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, use a quick example here because it's something I am very passionate about. So this is one of the boards we have, right? That this goes inside of the buoy. On the back, there's a ARM 10-pin SWD connector, so we can do JTAG. That's great. But if it's inside of an enclosure, you don't have that anymore, right? So this is kind of what go goes out of the buoy. There's a bunch of connectors, but we don't have access to JTAG. So if this is boot looping and we want to access, see what's going on, you can't. You got to open it up unless <laughs> you read the USB-C spec and you do some uh, interesting tricks. So I made a little adapter that lets me use SLED over USB-C. And so I can plug this in, it'll pass through USB and still expose the SLED lines over the USB-C connector. So I could still access JTAG if I wanted to. Um, it's, yeah, <laughs> but that's Product what I would do. Idea. It's a product idea right there, man. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm making these things right now for myself and, and for work, but it's, it's fun. That's awesome. I, I love it. I would supplement that with, um, you know, if your device is in a crash loop, you can keep a record of how many crashes have occurred. You can save at least the latest, you know, core dump, crash dump logs, whatever you can get. And if you have a threshold you've exceeded where you determine we're stuck in a loop, um, have a, a simple fallback firmware or a bootloader that knows how to say, this is a bad image. I'm going to call home. I'm going to report the issue and I'm going to check for like a known good firmware image or try to restore to some particular version. Um, you, can, you can do that. And I've done that on multiple products. So adding on to that, uh, for example, right now we're, we're introducing uh, using MCU boot, the bootloader. And with that, you can have two images and when you do an update if the new image doesn't confirm saying like hey i'm good it's just going to revert right back on the next reboot so if if you do have an issue that's coming up on boot it would have not made it past the first kind of confirmation and it would just get swiped right back to the last known good working uh, image that's great we have another question here um this is asking you know what happens if a device um doesn't have network connectivity, like never, never essentially recovers connectivity. What, what do you do in that case? In our case, we're screwed because we don't know where it is. <laughs> and if you know where it is, you're going to get on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or have to, or pay someone to go get it. Yep. Right. Um, but you know, let's, we could also say we're not in the middle of the ocean and my device fails and I know where it's at. Um, you could, like we mentioned, send somebody out to go get it, to go debug it. You could do an RMA process. You get the failed device back. You send them a new device. No need to make your customer suffer, right? Um, you could also, if it's possible, um, you know, it's not always possible. We used to do this all the time. So I could debug failures in the factory from the comfort of my home in California without having to get on a plane to China. We'd have one computer in the factory that we could um, connect to. And the CM team would put failed units that I wanted to analyze. I'd connect them over USB to that computer, and I could connect with, you know, a GDB remote or you know SSH in and run things locally or remote desktop and interact with the device. Um, and if connectivity is just a known problem, like you just need to plan for the persistent storage in advance. You need to have that SD card that you can write all the data. To, so that whenever you do get around to analyzing the device, you can see the, the full history there and you can you know, actually reconstruct the problem rather than just getting a failed device that you couldn't look at like you know, in the situation it was failing in and then turns out you can't reproduce it locally, right? Now, what are you gonna do? 
I, I have a, a quick, yeah, a confirmation on this. At an old job, we, we had these, it was just Raspberry Pis that would automatically connect to the network. And then a tech could, you know, plug it into any device and then anyone else from anywhere in the world could connect to that and, and, and debug it. And for folks who are starting to implement that, I know Raspberry Pi is an Optanium, but even if it's a computer, um, a lot, one of the big issues with vendors, sites and stuff, is actually connecting to the device, right? Uh, so these days now we have new software defined, software defined network like VPN stuff, so WireGuard. So TailScale is a tool that I highly recommend is just installing your devices and they all have, they can see each other. It does all the NAT network magic to let them connect. And, and it's much simpler to set up than, than it used to be. That's a great recommendation. Oh, and also this is a wish list. I haven't done it yet, but now we have web USB. Right. <laughs> so you oh, could yeah. just have a website that say, hey, customer, plug this into your device, run Chrome and say connect. And then you could, with the right tool, just uh, access the, the terminal, if you will, for your device. Fantastic. Um, Maybe yeah, it's and, a new feature. Our... <laughs> <laughs> um, Philip, you, you touched on this a little bit, but like after you've recovered the device, what sorts of things do you, you know, put into your firmware ahead of time, right? Um, to make sure that you can actually access the data that's stored on it. What do you mean? Um, like th things like a CLI, like what are the sort of things you think about or like mm. a way to, to dump the flash, you know, like stuff like that. Yeah, CLI is always very helpful. Nowadays, I tend to do it a little more programmatically using something like Nano PB or Thrift to make it um, present itself as an interface that I can like, you know, I could write a Python script that does whatever I needed to do by calling these functions available on my device. But I think that's definitely essential. You that could do right. a bunch of it with GDB and open OCD if you wanted to put, you know, run the raw memory commands and all that. But that's just a pain. So it's certainly better to, you know, have some kind of abstraction or functionality in place to make it you, easy. You save the code space at least fill up. But oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? That hundred uh, bytes, <laughs> right? The 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 one thing to know here at Pebble, it was it was most important to keep the logs and the core dump before the issue actually took place, rather than the latest. So like mm -hmm. for reboot loops, we never overwrote the core dump. We would we would have a bit on every core dump that would said this one has has been read out or this one has been confirmed as being read out because it's never the issue I guess after the corruption or after the hardware failure it's the issue that led to the hardware failure that you're actually or like you know the actual issue that you're trying to keep track of makes sense and when we had so much flash space um, we could have two and it was the one before or the one that like the first crash and then the one crash after that we wouldn't keep the latest. I just have to laugh that you had so much flash space so you could keep two. <laughs> I mean, we uh, real luxury. we we had we we talked to people that we we talked to one customer who's like, oh my god, we need to expand our flash part because we want to store more mempool data, um, mm -hmm. and we did the same with our Pebble. It was like it's worth it to save the developer time to like increase the flash space to store two core dumps. Right, we, uh, we we did that. <laughs> I will say these days, uh, Winbond Flash is like super cheap. Spy Flash, just drop it in for fifty cents, and you don't have to get another micro. Yeah, give and your, uh, give your it's crazy. Some cookies. <laughs> yes, it's crazy how like, given those prices and the ease of it, how much I still am surprised that people don't anticipate the extra flash needs for storing this debugging data. But even like, okay, we plan to launch and develop these features after we've released our product, but uh-oh, now we realize we don't have enough memory or flash to support the full feature set. I mean, happens all the time, right? So definitely put down way more memory than you think because you're going to use it, right? It's like any other resource. The resource is there, you're gonna take advantage of it, you're gonna fill it up, you're gonna wish you had more. And it's all compromised, right? Like we talked about for, for safety of, of, of bad firmware update, we have two images of, of the, the main program. So that just half how much space we have. Yep. Um, that's awesome stuff. Uh, quick time out. Um, so we're gonna continue for another few minutes because there's been like a ton of awesome questions and we'd like to get to as many as we can. Um, but for folks who do have to leave, uh, we'll, as we said at the beginning, we'll be sending out this recording and some other information, including some links to um, these lovely folks, uh, various blogs or podcasts. Um, please check them out. They're fantastic. Um, yeah. So th and thank you all for attending for those who do have to leave um, and for those who are staying.
All right. So we have this other um, excellent question, which is kind of near and dear to my personal heart. Um, so what are some of the patterns used to um, detect or prevent race conditions in a system, a multi-threaded system? Well, one invaluable tool, and I think this is one of the biggest benefits of being able to run more of your software off the target hardware, is the thread sanitizer library. I have caught so many race conditions in my software by just compiling it with thread sanitizer and running my unit test suite with thread sanitizer or running a little simulator with some limited set of the program. And I mean, it will tell you exactly where a race condition is happening, what caused it, you know, what the, where the location you need to change is. Um, and that makes it so easy to, to get rid of some of those problems. Now, if you're have like an interrupt race, you know, I, I think that might be a little harder to detect. Um, in that case, I'd probably recommend you need some, you know, cues can help. You're decoupling the access to the data from when that data is produced or um, you're potentially going to want to use things like atomic reads and writes. Um, certainly locks are important, right? But I think just for diagnosing problems, man, thread sanitizer has been like, that could have been my favorite tool, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, for, for especially for ARM systems that where interrupts can interrupt each other, you know, like it's a nested vector interrupt controller, right? Um, the less time you spend an interrupt, the, the, the smaller mm -hmm. chance you're going to have of issues, right? So if you do have an RTOS or something, and or even if you don't, it's just setting a flag and then going back to the main to, to the main context and, and then addressing it. The only time you actually need to do something interrupt is when you really have to do some real time um, response, which most of the time we don't like, we really, really don't the, the, the context, which is so quick these days for most applications. Again, you know, if you're ma making a rocket, maybe not, but, but even then it's probably still fast enough. Nice. Um, yeah. One, one technique that I remember that I was really uh, sort of amazed by was, um, that we had a problem in a UR driver and the guy who was, um, sort of debugging the problem or like trying to iron it out. He was setting up um, the interrupt to fire one cycle by cycle, essentially. Um, so he'd run his main loop and then just fu basically fuzz it <laughs> with the interrupt at every point through the execution of his code. And uh, it was a great test. It was amazing. So I thought that was a great strategy. Let's see where we got for our next question. Just one second. Yeah, do you, do you guys have any experience keeping like clones of fielded devices to like replicate what's going on in, in those? I, I'd say if you are able to, if you have the room, keep uh, every version, every configuration you can think of, right? Like if, you, if your hardware can have like three modules attached, keep three different versions of the hardware with one of each. Uh, in a perfect world, you would run all of your hardware integration, all, the, all, your, all your tests through each like possible version. Uh, every configuration. This is not, you know, not everyone can do this, right? But th that would be kind of the the ideal. And then, yeah, when you do have a, an issue, or if you ever have a weird issue that only comes up in certain hardware, keep one of those at least, so you can test you know, your possible fixes, your workarounds, and, and make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Very nice. Thank you. That's a that's a great answer. <laughs> um, Philip, another question for you. I'm sorry, you've been on. In the hot seat a bit lately, but um, so this this person is asking. I'm curious what other methods you use to get it right the first time. Um, yeah, so I think code reviews are a pretty essential part of my process. Maybe we could rephrase it as design reviews, right? We've taken care of more of the syntactical concerns and correctness concerns to some degree with testing and static analysis, and there shouldn't be formatting debates. We have automated formatting, but someone should still sanity check that like what we think things should be doing is makes sense. Um, and so I think that's pretty valuable. I'm very much a person who likes to document um, before I implement just to make sure I have a clear picture. I like to um, test things out at the place I intend to use it, right? Just to make sure my interface makes sense and like what that function's doing actually makes sense in the context it's gonna be used in. I like to write tests first, um, just to, to make sure that I'm not writing tests that actually like confirm behavior that I don't want to, to be in there, right? I'm actually making my expectations clear and then writing the code. I'm not a hardcore TDD guy. I'd say that I practice weak TDD at best, um, but I, I do see value in that. Um, so I think those are, you know, there's just 
part of it is just approaching it with intentionality and, and taking that seriously. And I think that I look for techniques like that that allow me to be clearer about what I'm doing and why, and then just make sure that what I actually did matches that. Yeah, I, I just want to extra emphasize the test in the environment it's going to be used then to the best of your ability. Like I said, one of our bugs happened to be in, in GPS and, and it only came up when the unit was on and moved like many, many miles while it was running. If, if we had just turned it on another place, it would have been fine. If we just turned on the office, it'd be fine. But when it's moving, that's when the issue came up. And the only reason we caught it is because we were testing. We were we put in a boat and we went and, and deployed it somewhere like nearby to test, you know, to put it in the ocean and, and have it get beat up by waves and stuff. But if we hadn't done actual testing, geographically varied testing, we would have not caught this issue until it was too late. And that's a great point that I have a fun story for. So one of the first systems I worked on was a device to collect data during an IED explosion. And um, obviously it's very hard to design a system that survives explosions, but in order to test that your system functions correctly, you do have to detonate explosives near it. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to do. So part of that was like, okay, we get three multi-million dollar events where they're gonna blow up a vehicle with C4. Um, so first of all, I gotta get it right. But um, if we hadn't done that, then we wouldn't have noticed problems with the device like, oh, it turns out when you set off a boatload of C4 next to this device, now we have mechanical ringing in the PCB due to the way that it's mounted that's actually making our accelerometer data completely invalid, right? Um, so it's you have to take time to get out of the office and to actually test your product in real world scenario. Oh, that's an amazing story. <laughs> what an incredible product to work on. I can't imagine. <laughs> it feels a little um, bad when you then go and strap it onto soldiers who are your age going to war, right? So, you know, there's a, the balance, but it was fun engineering. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions on the topic of sort of like third-party libraries or third-party SOCs. So um, what sort of strategies are good when you don't really have control over what a device or um, a, a block of code is doing? I can answer it slightly. And I think every time we included a library, we'd create some sort of a shim layer or some like isolated in some fashion, wrap it in asserts or wrap it in sort of expectations that we assume are met. And when they aren't met, the system will like yell pretty loudly. And then we can either fix the bug, report a bug, downgrade to a new or an older version, or, you know, yeah, if you have a compiled library without debug symbols, honestly, good luck. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, in those situations, at least at Pebble, we just like asked and asked and asked for source code or debug symbols. And, and sometimes we paid for it. And and just like, we, I don't think we ever really used a compiled library if we could help it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can look at the disassembly to at least track down and confirm an issue is the case. Am I? dereferencing an address that's totally invalid. Can I trace this to the module itself, right? I mean, but you can't do anything other than treat it as a black box. And you, I think your shim layer with the certs and expectations is a, is a great point, right? Because you're gonna at least detect if the library isn't behaving in the way that you expect rather than just have that silently passed to your application where then the failure, you know, is gonna manifest in some way that may not be obviously from a, wrong expectation about that library or even a bug with that library. So you want to try to trap that failure as close to the source as you can. And I think that's just generally, you know, a, a way we want to handle debugging. Nice. Um, that's great, guys. And then um, I have one more question that um, I think is really fascinating. Um, so how do you debug deadlock, deadlock conditions in a multi-threaded uh, system? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, watchdogs are great, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's multiple types of watchdogs. You can have your, if, if you don't feed this hardware watchdog, it's just going to restart your system, but you can also have, you know, for example, I have a, a lowest priority task is feeding my watchdog. Right. And, and if there's any tasks in a deadlock, that's not going to catch it because if it's a deadlock, it means all the other tasks are still running just fine. And these two are just frozen. So you need to have some sort of other method to, to you know, timers. You, you could have a, a, um, a, a task that checks in and other tasks. And, and it's like, oh, this one hasn't reported into me. I think that's a more comprehensive for, for our TOS systems. You might have a, a task that either pulls or, or waits for 
events to happen. And if they don't, you'll start a timer and then you can hit an assert, for example, and capture kind of the state of your system. That's kind of a hard handed way, but you can also just go look and see what's going on. Fully agree with that. Um, I would say, you know, smaller methods, I mean, you should do that, but smaller indicators that can be added are just what's the state of every thread in the system? What's the state of every mutex object in the system? You know, are they locked, unlocked? What threads are blocked? Um, and at least when you have that, you can tell what's dead locking, period, and you know where to look. Again, it definitely, yeah, yeah, it takes a lot more architecturing and, and, and thinking about your system, right? Because if, yep. if you try to add that, you're going to end up like, wait, do I need to extern all of my mutexes? Do I, what, what do I need to do? It's, uh, it's not something you can easily add after the fact. Right. But multi threaded problems are, you know, and especially deadlocks, like if you're going to take on the complexity of multi threaded program, you got to be prepared to, to handle situations like that. So I think doing it up front, it's like, you know, if you can't put in that kind of support, try to find another way than a threaded program, perhaps. I mean, there's a reason there's 600 page books on how to write multi-threaded programs in C and C++. Well, it's I'll, hard. I'll say a, a, a cheap or an easy way to, to deal with this is usually, I mean, at least on free RTOS and, 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 and many others, when you do try to request a resource, there's always a timeout argument, right? Just don't wait forever. Yeah. Just wait for exactly. some amount. And then if, if it returns, you know something went wrong, you can flag it. Yep. Great point. I, I almost always use timeouts. I, I very much am scared of wait forever code. <laughs> yeah. On the flip and side, when it, I'm, when I'm if, if, it, if it's timeout, assert internally, like may or just be sure it's loudly, right? Like don't be okay. It's like malloc, malloc failing. It's probably a bug. Sorry, Noah, go ahead. So I was going to say on the flip side, one of my colleagues um, is heavily into the wait forever. Uh, ethos. <gasps> <laughs> then the system is going to crash, right? You got your watchdog. It's going to fire. Yeah. But I, well, I no, no, that's the thing. It might not both. fire. If, if, depending on how you set up your watchdog, because like if, if your watchdog is being fed by just a task that if any other task kind of is in a spin loop, it's fine. But if it's waiting, that means the task is asleep. So the RTOS can keep doing like serve all the other tasks. So that that's the main danger of it. That you won't notice. Very true. Very true. Um, okay, I think that's about it for our time. Unfortunately, we have a couple of extra good questions um, that we'll hopefully be able to answer in the interrupt slack. But I would just like to say thank you so much to everyone who attended. So it's great, and thank you so much to our uh, panelists. Um, we're very, very grateful for your time here today um, and sharing all your wonderful stories. Here oh, thanks. Is, this is fun. Uh, yeah. Here's some contact information for everyone, and um, we're going to share out this recording, um, these um, few slides, and a couple of interesting links for y'all. And uh...